How would you handle the circumstance had you be the one in Philip's shoes? Could you be trusted as a faithful steward with the word of God? Could you have led this individual to Christ as Philip did? Would you have gave him the full story that it's not just about being saved, but somewhere along the line the eunuch knew that he must, he should, that Jesus told him to be baptized. If this man did not know Jesus, how did he know to be baptized? Philip must have went through the full course of the gospel with him. Can we be faithfully trusted enough of God, obedient to the Holy Spirit, to run to the eunuch and share with him the full course of the gospel all the way through baptism? Think about that for a moment. That's the first takeaway we can get from this. But let's move on to the eunuch for a moment. What's the second takeaway? We'll call this a teachable heart. Don't you love when somebody is open to the gospel? This eunuch was one very much like Nicodemus, remember? I had mentioned in John chapter 3, we get our power verse, John 3, 3. Except a man be born again, he can never see the kingdom of God. In other words, you've got to be safe. Jesus articulated in the conversation with Nicodemus that self-reform can't do it. You must be born again. Everybody knows that New Year's Day at Times Square with your little hat and your little glasses which says 2020 or something does not change your life. That, that self-reform and turning a new leaf is not going to stick. But that there must be more to this change in one's life. That it must be born again. That things all must be new is what Paul put it. That there is a difference between self-reform. That one must believe. One must repent. One must confess with the mouth unto salvation. That's all Philip did. That's resonated to his family. His daughters received the Lord. They prophesied. He was obedient to the Holy Spirit. Philip that being. And it said that he ran. Which is indicative of a fervor and excitement. To share the gospel with someone. And who was waiting Someone with a teachable heart. And that is our second point. A teachable heart. Folks, curiosity of the gospel is where evangelism buds. Are we doing just that? The Bible says, plant the seed, Scott. The Bible says, water the seed, Scott. I had a pastor the other day, he was talking. He was discouraged and he was saying, you know what? I, I preach, I do this, I share, I have a great hunger in my heart. But where does people get saved? There are moments, there's revivals, there's periods. But just regularly there's dry spells. The people are not rededicated, they're not saved. I had to encourage him that God is not about us bringing the increase, but us being faithful stewards like Philip was. Amen. I remember there was a time when me and Eddie was baptizing people in swimming pools and baptistries. I remember one pastor, I believe I made him angry because I said, I can I borrow your baptistry? We got six people to baptize. He was probably thinking, buddy, I don't know. Won't you get your own baptistry or why couldn't they be bad? Why couldn't he? Why couldn't that be at my church? Perhaps I don't know what people's thinking. That's probably sometimes if I let their own nature get in me, I want that. Things take a turn. Times change. And let me tell you, if you think for one second the devil's not busy and putting a, putting a bushel under the light of the gospel, if you think there is not a withdrawing or a losing of that wonderful spirit in certain sectors, man, you're living under a rock. This thing, it's getting harder to get the gospel yeah, that's out. Right, that's right. It is getting tougher because hearts are growing colder. And frankly, there's a lot of preachers that's not being faithful to the true gospel that they should be preaching. And people are getting weaker in the churches. That's right. I believe Philip preached a true gospel. But let me get back to this teachable heart. We got to seize the moment. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 redeem the time, Gatewood brethren, church, because the days are approaching. The days are fewer. And people are lost and going to hell. And the churches oftentimes are either battling between one another or caught up in some kind of religiousness to where people are dying in droves and going to devil's hell. 
How do you redeem the time, Scott? Let me give you some numbers for just a moment. Somebody says, well, why are you, why are you, why are you doing a Sunday evening webcast, Scott? We could be in the church right here. I get that. And if we had a good hookup, maybe we could do a telecast and do them both from right here. But let me share something with you. That little webcast that we got out there that will be on tonight at 7 o'clock is going actively right now. Listen to this. To Kenya, to Canada, to Uganda, to the Philippines, to Bangladesh, to Bahrain, to South Africa, to China, to Nigeria, and throughout the United States of America. These are countries where people are actively talking to us about the gospel through that telecast, through our Sunday messages posted, through our encouraging words throughout the day. In 27-day period from September 17 to October 14, 28 days rather, we reached 3,259 people. Out of them 3,259 that scrolled, looked, and listened, guess how many clicked on and said, I want to know more about what you're talking about. 1,804 different people clicked and said, I want to hear more about this gospel. Now, you compare them numbers to what we got in the sanctuary today. Folks, we got to come outside of the box. We got to redeem the time. And although it may cramp our style, think of that person in communist China that gets our publication. Think of them people down there in Kenya that somehow got internet access and I don't even understand how they got it, but they could be every Sunday with a family of three little children that don't even interact but are saying, tonight at seven, kids, get your bath done because we're going to listen to that church over there in America as they bring out a message or they share something with us about Jesus because we don't get it here. And if you think that they get a lot of it there... Think about Brother Bonface when we sent him the Bibles. You know what he was using for Bibles? Little raggedy, tattered, old pieces of Sunday school quarterlies and trying to connect them together so that everybody would have something relevant to gain from what they preached because nobody, nobody, Seth, had a Bible, man. And here in America, Bibles just lay in piles. I was in a bookstore some years back. I wish I would have bought it. There was a Bible in there for a dollar in a bargain bin. Mm -hmm. I thought all of the people dying, going to hell, and all the problems, and here's the Holy Bible, Genesis to Revelation in a bargain <coughs> bin. You know what the bargain bin is? The books that nobody wants. Mm -hmm. Brother Bonface takes her Bibles. He puts them in a bag or a box. He wades in a suit with a tie into a boat across the marshy mud. He gets in it and he floats across Lake Victoria, which is bigger than Little Beaver Lake, much bigger, in a canoe with muddy shoes, still putting his tie on for Jesus. He gets over to the island, the Segulu Island. He steps out of the boat with the mud specks on the box. He walks into a village to a dirt floor church a shanty of a building. And he hands the Bibles. And they stand and they hold them up and they smile and take a picture because the church in Gatewood got them some Bibles that we got from the Dollar Tree. Yeah, I, uh, thank you, Jesus. That is ministry. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. It ain't about putting money in somebody's pocket. It's about somebody with a teachable heart wanting Jesus and us redeeming the time and them saying, you know what? I want to receive that Jesus. I want that Bible. I want to set in your service. Yes, I'll take a love offering. Yes, I'll take this. But I want Jesus in my life. Amen. Amen. Ten different countries. That just amazes me. So a teachable heart is our second and our last takeaway. We make disciples. Churches should be making disciples. Philip made a disciple out of the eunuch. But here's the interesting part. He worked for Candace the Queen. He was in a great position of respect and authority. 
What you saw take place between Philip and him was just the small tip of the iceberg. Imagine what he did when he took it back to where he worked for the queen. Imagine how the gospel resonated in the life of a man that was so hungry he stopped his car to read Isaiah and here along came led of the Holy Spirit a gospel disciple that led him to Christ fully and now this man is reaching the queen. That is what ministry, but do we make disciples? You go to Sand Hill, Fort Benning, or you go to Paris Island, South Carolina, and just like the Marines who said a big sign, we make Marines at Sand Hill, it said we make infantry soldiers. It's a sign that says we do this. We show, shape them, we mold them, we make them. And it's the same way. A church should have that mentality. We make disciples, but do we? Do I carry the mentality to make a disciple? I want you to take note that just as Philip was obedient and disciplined to engage the eunuch, so we got to engage people for Christ. Amen. I want you to understand also that this evangelism that was shared to the eunuch here is just a piece of what the church should be effectively seeking. Maybe we're lacking in opportunity and ability, but have you ever thought maybe we should be praying for that? Have you ever thought that maybe we need more insight and more wisdom on the cuff? That maybe, maybe, maybe I even fail somebody that comes to the church like that. It prompts me to say, Scott, have I done everything that I could have done? I have never in 17 years at this church, I cannot put my finger on one time that somebody called me on the phone, somebody come to church, that I didn't look over my shoulder and say, boy, I blew that one. Did I do the right thing? I always feel like we didn't do enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we offer them enough? Did I get defensive? Mm -hmm. Did I handle it right? Did I apply the right love? In a world we live, it's hard. You feel you must defend the church. But Jesus can do that. We need the wisdom to know when and how to apply the gospel proper. That's ministry and definition. But at the same time, we got to be wise as serpent, harmless as doves. And if anybody understands what that means, or doesn't understand rather, it means that a serpent never unduly puts himself in a position that will bring upon unneeded attack or approach. But at the same time, they are as harmless as a dove as to say, what I have is, is yours. Is the church doing that? <clears throat> Jesus never called me to replace him. Jesus called me to be a faithful steward with what he gave me to work with. The eunuch was born again. Came into a, I would love to hear the rest of the story. Maybe one day in heaven we'll be able to find out. Buddy, how'd things go after you and Philip's interaction there? Well, let me tell you about it. This is what had happened. I went back and we had the greatest, greatest little revival right there. This person, I got an opportunity to let him. We got into this. Next thing you know, we had five people saved in a Bible study. There was a great thing going on. The whole climate changed there. And it all began with what Philip did. And I close on this. It all began one, the Holy Spirit spoke to Philip. Philip unhesitantly moved by the leading of the Spirit. He ran with excitement to fulfill the curiosity of the one hungering for the gospel and one was born again and he even got his clothes wet, stopped the car to baptize him. That's awesome. Let's stand together as we